Okay, hi everybody, I'm James Morrell, I'm an alcoholic, and it is only by God's grace through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, through a lot of people just like you, that I had my last drink July 11th of 1981. That's one month and 40 years today, and what a blessing, what a blessing it has, it has been. But it's the people who were reporting 100 uh, days, 201 days. Uh, uh, y'all, y'all are in for such a grand adventure. You know, this is this is a fabulous, fabulous way of life. Um, let me get a few preliminaries out of the way. First of all, I want to thank Glenn for asking me to share my story. Uh, um, and. Uh, I'm really kind of a filler. Next week, uh, Vivian Q will make you one hell of an AA talk. I've, I've heard her before, and you're really in for a, for a treat. So you just have to suffer through with James. I'm not a circuit speaker. I'm, I'm what they call a short circuit speaker. I, I have little short circuits up here and little fuses that have blown and things. So we, we don't know what's going to what's going to come out. But the one thing that will come out is that I love Alcoholics Anonymous and I love its people. And it is it has filled my heart with everything that I ever thought that I wanted in life. I've gotten through Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, look where I am today. Uh, today, uh, last weekend, I was in uh, Bryan, Texas, where Texas A&M University is for the Aggieland AA convention. They got a couple of hundred people. It was all in person. Everybody was hugging and loving on each other. And uh, one of the things that I love about our conventions, at least here in the South, and I hope in, in your area, is that we bring our children to these things. We bring the little tykes, you know, and they're all running around and everything. And, and uh, they're seeing their parents sober. And they're going to grow up in a sober atmosphere. And this brings a lot of hope into the world. And they bring a lot of joy into these things. We had some good talks and everything. And then from there, I came over here 90 miles west to Round Rock, Texas, which is just outside of Austin, uh, to visit Robert and Sandy. Uh, Robert has been sober now for well, if he can make it to Christmas Eve, he'll have 30 years in this, in this beautiful program. Um, it wasn't easy. Uh, uh, he got sober in uh, Christmas of 91. I started 12-step in the little SOB in uh, 87. He was in jail in Houston. And his sister, who was a good client and a good friend of mine, asked me if I'd go over and talk to him and see if I could work something out. And so I did. And uh, I managed to get him out of that deal. And then he would get into more trouble in, uh, in Austin. And I could go get him out of that deal. And I'd get him out time and time and time again. And, and I would just really lay alcoholics and I on. Had no effect whatsoever. None at all. None at all. Finally, in December of 91, before one of the court appearances, I said, Robert, I've had it. I, I'm not going to be your sponsor anymore. I'm not going to be your AA friend anymore. I'm just going to be your lawyer. Uh, you're going to have to find your own way. And I said, let's go on into court. And I went into court, and Judge Wizard says, call me up to the bench, and he says, because by this time, we've been in with Judge several times. He says, Mr. Morrell, what are we going to do with this little son bitch?" <laughs> and I said, beats me, Judge. I don't know. Maybe you ought to uh, cool him off for a while. Well, he gave him only 45 days. And, uh, but the point is, is that after I let go, after I let go, he wanders into a meeting on Christmas Eve and he hears the message of Alcoholics Anonymous 
and he hasn't had a drink since then. Now, you never know whether you planted a seed or you've just been there, but we've been just close, wonderful friends ever since. And that's the story of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic to penetrate this incredible wall that separates us from God and from the universe and from each other and even from ourselves, you know, and uh, leaves us surrounded by, by love. Now, I just celebrated 40 years. And I want to show you something that Robert's wife, Sandy, made me as a gift for my 40th birthday. She made me a quilt that has camels and triangles and circles all in it. A gorgeous, gorgeous handmade quilt. I mean, I, I'm, I'm gonna just really enjoy that. That's the, that's one of the blessings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, so I move around a bit in AA, just like, just like Glenn has always, always done so. And, and the result of that is that uh, I have friends just about wherever, wherever I go. And that my world, which has shrunk so small, has, has expanded to all of you folks. And uh, all right, well, let me tell you something about, um, about myself. I grew up not feeling like, like most alcoholics, I'm feeling like I fit or I belonged. I, uh, I was a little fat kid. I was uh, roly poly and short and I didn't feel accepted. Kids made fun of me. My nickname was rubber butt <laughs> or tanky. You know, and when kids call you that, you know, you're just kind of on the outside and um, kids can be so cruel. But one thing I could do is I can make the straight A. So I thought, you know, if, if, if you won't accept me, I'll show you. I'll show you that I can be the number one man. And, um, and I was pretty good at doing that. Straight A, straight A student. No Bs, no nothing. Just straight A's. But I really wanted to be one of the guys and dance with the girls, especially about age 13, 14, when I noticed that you lovely ladies we're starting to, uh, uh, let's say, your shape started to change in an incredibly pleasant way, in a way that really, you know, we talk about A being a program of attraction. Y'all were a program of attraction, believe me. But if your nickname is Rubber Butt, <laughs> you're not, uh, you, you're just kind of the outside looking in, and a friend invited me. Uh, one of my, really my only friend, he said, hey, why don't we go over to the dance at the girls' school at, at the gym, the sock up over there. I said, I don't want to go, I, you know. He said, oh, come on, come on, come on. So uh, he and I went over there, paid our quarter to get in, and after we got in, the girls were all on that side, and all the party's going on. I'm hanging out about, about the wall, and um, just – incredibly un uncomfortable, incredibly ill at ease and disconnected. And Cyrus says, look, I got a fifth of dad's old charter out in the car. Would you like a pull of that old charter? I said, listen, he could have offered. I wanted to get out of there so bad. He could have said, I've got some Drano out in the car. You want a drink of it? And I said, yeah, let's get out of here. So we go out to uh, his, he had his daddy's 57 Ford. He pulls under the seat, a brand new bottle of old charter. And he pulls that cork out and he goes, Ploop. to this day, I love that sound for a cork coming out of that bottle. Ploop. And uh, he takes a pull off of it and I take a pull and good God, it's going down. I mean, it just, and I knew it was going to come right back up. But I had to hold on to it. I couldn't, uh, you know, in front of my friend, I couldn't be uh, uh, a wimp. And he hit on down and 
He took another pull. I took another pull. And I'll tell you what, about the time of that second pull, glitter exploded all inside of me. It was a whole different feeling. It felt like all the broken parts and, and things that didn't quite fit all came together. And wow, what a feeling. What a wonderful feeling. I mean, I'd had sips of beer before. I'd had sips of wine and whatever, but not ever enough to do any good. This time, the effect was there. The effect produced by alcohol was to relieve the alcoholism that I was already suffering from and didn't know what it was called. So alcohol did for me what I couldn't do for myself at the age of 14. And now rubber butt may have walked out into that parking lot, but Tab Hunter walked back into that dance looking for Debbie Reynolds. And I tell you what, now, most of y'all are too young to even know who the hell they are. Go ahead and Google them and find out. <laughs> uh, but they were the current heartthrobs of the day. And I was able to go up to Nancy and say, hey, Nancy, you want to dance? And she said, yeah. And we danced. And then we kept making trips out to the car and out to the car and getting more, more and more whiskey. And I kept getting feeling better. I got to feeling so good, couldn't feel at all. <laughs> Finally, the end of the night came, and, and uh, uh, I only lived a couple of blocks from there, and it wasn't unusual for Cyrus to come spending the night over, the, or we'd spend the night at his house, or, you know, guys just, a lot of guys did that in those days, and um, so we went over, over to my house, and as soon as we got over there, we got sick. I mean, we got really sick. We're barfing, we're puking. We're dying. Mom comes in. And you know how moms are. Mom says, oh, what's wrong? Well, what's the alcoholic answer? What's the alcoholic answer? Oh, mom, we got the flu. We got the flu. Oh, you know, she says, oh, poor boys. Now, we were, moms, of course, God bless moms. God, God bless the mothers of this world. They'll put up with you when nobody else will. And, and my little scheme would have worked, except back in those days, doctors made house calls. So mom calls Dr. Gajan, who only lived a couple of blocks away, and he says, come over quick. Cyrus and James are dying. So he rushes, he throws some clothes on and close to midnight and comes over there and he, he takes one look at us. He says, Wendy, these boys aren't sick. They're drunk. So, <laughs> so busted the first time out, you know, busted. You know, if you get busted out the first time out, you might as well just give it up, you know. <laughs> but, of course, uh, I set out from there uh, because I'd found a solution. I'd found a solution to my isolation. I'd found a solution to living apart. A um, I'd found a sense of wholeness. Um, you know, Carl Jung, in that famous letter to Bill Wilson uh, in 1961, where Bill had written Carl, and to thank him for the efforts that he had made in dealing with Roland Hazard, which launched Roland uh, into the Oxford group, which got Abby sober, which got Bill sober. And, uh, and, and Jung replied, he said, well, you know, the... Uh, a thirst for alcohol on a low level is the equivalent of the, in medieval terms, of our this need for wholeness, of union with God, if you would. And uh, I'll tell you what, I felt a union with God, my fellow man, and the universe at that point. And uh, I mean, I always believe in God, but I tell you what, the whole old charter really did it. Um, then I set out never to get drunk again because drunk was puking. I wanted to just get right there. I wanted to get at that point where I was feeling great and in charge. And I could get there. But if you're alcoholic, you can't stay there. For the first few years, alcohol did more for me than it took from me. You know, I... I 
graduated valedictorian in my high school class. I got a National Merit Scholarship. It was the moon race time, and I wanted to go off to LSU and, and be a rocket scientist. And uh, that would have worked. Uh, and, but after my freshman year, of which I did still was the overachiever, still making the straight A's, I discovered that the bingo bar and lounge sold rocket fuel. And so instead of having a drink on the way home from classes, I would start having a drink on the way to classes. Well, Thus began the series of ups and downs, which continued for a number of years, where I uh, uh, got drunk at final exams, flunked two courses, uh, ended up uh, losing my National Merit Scholarship. Uh, then I'd pull myself back together and make straight A's again and screw up and whatever. Found myself finally, I was going to quit school and ended up in law school. and. Uh, uh, and I finally passed the bar, and then I just didn't pass very many bars. I, you know, when you live in New Orleans, I went to New Orleans, and I knew that's where the party was. And I lucked out. I got a job with the biggest and best law firm in, uh, in the city of New Orleans, or indeed in the South at the time. And I had a break, and I knew it. And uh, as the book says, that there are times given enough sufficient reason if the alcoholism is not too far progressed, uh, we'll pull ourselves together. And I did for a while, and I, I did extremely well. But they gave me an unlimited expense account to entertain the clients. And if you have an unlimited expense account to spend an unlimited amount at the finest bars and restaurants in New Orleans, I want to tell you what, for the next seven years, I did not let that firm down. But the trouble begins. You know, my senior year of law school married a, a beautiful young woman. Uh, uh, the marriage proposal at LSU at that time was, your what? <laughs> well, your what is 52 years old out. I love her to death. So we, uh, Amanda and I, Amanda and I got, got married and... Uh, uh, and we had a and we had a boy four years later. But meanwhile, I started having problems with marriage. Started having problems showing up for for uh, at the office, uh, having to have a drink or two just to get into the office. Uh, uh, something's going wrong, and I don't know what it is. Uh, uh, the marriage breaks up. Uh, problems are happening. Uh, just in a mess, just in a mess. And I cannot figure out what's wrong with me. I started going to psychiatrists. I spent the last eight years before I got sober constantly going to one fancy, expensive psychiatrist after the other. And they were all telling me the same thing. You know, oh, you had a problem with your parents. Or it's your parents' fault. It's the way you raised up, you know. I uh, And, but none of it was helping me. And, uh, of course, they would ask me things like, uh, do you drink? I said, oh, no more than anybody else, you know. I mean, I thought maybe I had a brain tumor. And uh, so I checked into Oxner, Oxner Clinic in New Orleans, which is one of the finest in the country, you know, probably second only to the Mayo Brothers Clinic is uh, uh, in, in medical estimation. You know, it's a fancy place. And because uh, I'm, I'm shaking, you know, and, and uh, I'm not remembering things. And uh, I don't know that's called blackouts. I'm just, I'm having periods where I cannot remember where I was or what I was doing. And it's, uh, it's becoming frightening. So I check into Oxford and I figured they'll find the brain tumor. It's got, you know, it's got to be a brain tumor. Well, I went in there thinking they were the finest medical institution in the country. And I came in. Of course, they did ask me, uh, I must admit, they said, do, do, you, do, you, do you drink, Mr. Maroon? Oh, well, maybe a, a cocktail before dinner and uh, maybe a glass of wine with dinner. You know, no, nothing more than that. Nothing more than that. I mean, you don't want to tell these people, you know, I guzzled a fifth yesterday. <laughs> 
And I came out of there thinking these people are totally incompetent. They were unable to find the brain tumor. You know, there was, they said there's nothing they could find that was wrong. And the day came when the alcohol wouldn't take the fear away to allow me to go try lawsuits, which is what I was very, very, very good at. And uh, ended up resigning from the law firm and spent the next five years, uh, you know, all good alcoholics going to practice for themselves. And I'd pull myself together for a little while, make a little money, then go off on a long drunk and get lost. And I won't lead you through all of that, but let's just suffice to say that uh, uh, by Christmas of 79, I felt like I was one of the most lost, lonely people on the face of the planet. And at that Christmas, I managed to sober up just enough to get my Christmas girlfriend so that I would have somebody to spend Christmas with. And she was a really nice lady. And Christmas Eve, I was taking Jill and her whole family and everybody out to one of the really fancy restaurants of uh, Stephen and Martin's. And uh, we're there and I'm looking at all these people and I'm thinking to myself, I'm, I've got to get out of here. So finally I announced, I said, all right, everybody, we're going to midnight mass. And they looked at me like I was from another planet. I said, yeah, I want to go listen to the music. Come on. Now, if you're paying for everything, if you're the guy that's shelling out the cash, they're going to follow you, you know? So they followed me on over to the cathedral. There's been night services going on. First time I'd been in a church in years. And at communion time, I went up to the communion rail. I didn't take communion. The priest offered me the communion and I, I just shook my head. And it didn't sound like a prayer. It didn't sound like a prayer. But I said it out loud, and the priest just kind of looked at me. I said, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? I really didn't know. I think God answers prayers. I uh, proceeded. <laughs> uh, I was in the middle of settling a very, very big case, uh, settled a case. A uh, week or two later, uh, put more money in the bank than I'd ever had. Thought what I really need to do, of course, I'm self-diagnosing now. I'm going to go to Barbados. I don't know why Barbados, but I'm going to go to Barbados and I'm going to lay on the beach and I'm going to bake the booze out of me. And by God, I had a gold American Express card in my wallet. I cut $10,000 in cash in my my pants, and I was headed over to get a ticket to go to Barbados. And I thought, I can't let Dominique, that lovely travel agent, see my hand shaking like this. You know, I, I'd reached the point where I couldn't even hardly sign my endorse the check at the Whitney Bank. I'm, my hands are just shaking. So I stopped into a bar next to Cobb's restaurant, and uh, I'd been in there before. It's one of my regular noontime watering, watering holes. And, uh, but it's nine in the morning and I said, give me a double vodka because I don't want to really drink. I just want to get enough to shake, get the shakes down. Well, that son of a gun, was, I was the only person in there. He fills the old fashioned glass up to the brim. Well, there was no way I could lift it up without spilling it all over everything. So I'm just sitting there wanting to kill him and there's no straw or anything. And he's chatting me up. He said, Oh, I haven't seen much of you lately. How are you doing? You know, why don't you? and I'm thinking to myself, I'd like to kill this SOB, you know, just go, go away, go away. Finally, somebody else walked to the bar. He turns and I stick my face down in that vodka and I go. And that's where my alcoholism would take. I finished that. I had one more. I never did make the travel agent. Somehow I ended up, uh, I, I got in my car and I started wandering around. I had the most one, I had the drinking man's magic machine. It was one of those old Lincolns and it was copper colored with a beige fabric top. 
and uh, it was about 30 feet long. I mean, it had a hood that was so long you could have landed a Piper Cub on it. And you could go over four sets of railroad tracks with a full glass of whiskey on the dashboard, not spill a drop. I mean, it was rode that smooth. And the advantage was it had a hood ornament at the uh, uh, end of the hood, a uh, four pointed star. And when you started seeing two white lines, you were also seeing two horn ornaments. So you just line the two white lines up with the two horn ornaments. You went, whoa, you know, so it's a drinking man's club. And somehow instead of Barbados, I found myself in the little South Louisiana town of El Dorado, <laughs> Arkansas. Now, I don't know anybody in El Dorado. And my only memory of it is something to do with a poker game. And then I needed a bail bondsman. And I remember that bail bond agency uh, because it had two, a neon sign with like two boots that would walk back and forth, you know, flash back and forth. And another sign that flashed said, we put your feet on the street. We put your feet on the street. Well, I, put, I needed my feet put on the street in El Dorado. Well, I got my feet put on the street and uh, I never did go back. But interestingly enough, 20 years later, the El Dorado group invited me to tell my story. And when I mentioned that, you know, and I said, you know, this bail bond AC with his feet on the street, half the room immediately cries out, Ricky Bailey's bail bonds. You know, evidently they'd all used them. <laughs> but I didn't want to go back there for 20 years. I wanted to let all the statutes of limitations. Uh, uh, oh, but I didn't even know why I needed the bail bonds, I'll tell you the truth. Somehow or other, at the end of that drunk, I wound up in another mental hospital. It was my second mental hospital. I had no treatment center, second mental hospital. Diagnosis was, my psychiatrist diagnosis was always major depressing. Never diagnosed me as an alcoholic, even though I was dead drunk when I was, was admitted to it. Afterwards, uh, started going to this group therapy session. It was dreadful. It was not a, a alcohol, not alcohol at all. It was mostly uptown housewives that were bitching about their husbands, you know. Well, Fred took the Jaguar and made me drive the Cadillac today, you know. And I thought, ah, you know, taking that car, scrammed it. Never mind. Anyway. <laughs> I thought, you know, is this going to be my? Finally, I spoke up at that session. I said, uh, I'm afraid to leave my house. I do not know anybody that doesn't drink. And if I leave my house, I'm afraid I'm going to get drunk again. And uh, on that last drunk, which went for a couple of months, I, I blew fifty or $60,000. I have no earthly idea what I spent it on. And I'm afraid to leave my house. And a lady came up to me after the meeting and says, go to Alcoholics Anonymous. You'll meet some people that don't drink. I was out of good ideas at the time. You know, I made some smart ass remark about, well, I don't, you know, I've seen the camp in Julia, the Wino district. She says, no, there's a meeting near Tulane University. And there'll be a couple of college professors there and a, doctor and some lawyers and business people. With my ego, I, I went there. I was just completely out of, out of things. I loved you people. I thought you were crazy. I thought you were absolutely nuts. I mean, you were talking in that very first meeting about things that I had advised my clients to keep absolutely quiet about. You know, you don't tell that. And my mama had told me, you don't, you don't tell those things in public, you know. And, and y'all were talking about cheating on your wives and DWIs and getting locked up. And uh, the doctor who was there was talking about how he had messed up with his prescription pads and was writing himself. Oh, it just, uh, and I thought, huh, these, these people are crazy, but I love them. I mean, you know, it was genuine laughter. And uh, uh, God, we went out after the meeting to the river bend and, uh, I had a bar there. I thought, man, well, we're going to go have a couple of drinks at the Riverbend now to talk about what we did at the meeting. Instead, they order hot fudge sundays. I hadn't had any ice cream in five years. I mean, but I'm a people pleaser. They order hot fudge sundays. I'll order a hot fudge. Sundae. You know, 
And so began my journey in Alcoholics Anonymous. Over the next year and a half, I came to a meeting every day. All I did was come to a meeting. Y'all said, get a sponsor. I couldn't find anybody that was up to my standards. I thought, well, at least I ought to find somebody who was a president of the bank or a, a judge or a, a brain surgeon or something like that, you know. So I never got a sponsor. Um, the book Alcoholics Anonymous, I read the first few pages, 1939. Surely something more important has been written about that than since then. But I loved you people. The problem was I kept getting drunk time after time after time after time after time. And they were just like one day drunks. So I'd leave a meeting and, and go have a couple of drinks or I'd have to have a couple of drinks to go to a meeting. And um, I couldn't seem to stay sober. And this is baffling me because I really wanted what y'all had, but I, I, didn't know, I didn't know how to get it. I didn't know how to ask for help. And I, I took none of the actions of alcoholics. I just simply went to meetings. Well, finally, on July the 11th, 1981, I'd been drunk in my kitchen for five days. Now, all of these previous drunks since I'd come to AA have been like one day, and then I'd get sober. I'd just stop drinking, and then I'd come back to AA. Well, for five days, I had been unable to not drink. I couldn't leave the house. I, I, I lost all motor control. I couldn't drive the car. United Cab is delivering the booze to me, and uh, it's just a cheap vodka from the drugstore. They'd go buy a couple of fifths and bring it to me. And um, uh couldn't leave the house. I'd drink for two or three hours and pass out for two or three hours. The worst thing about that last drunk is that alcohol was not working for me anymore. I couldn't go into a blackout. It wasn't removing the guilt and the pain and the shame. The, the, every failure that I'd had in my life, every frustration was, uh, was there. It was just there. I'd be so drunk, I couldn't get up off the floor and my mind would be totally clear. I kept drinking myself sober. Horrible feeling, absolutely horrible. Came to on the morning of July the 11th, 1981. Needing a drink as badly as I'd ever needed it. I started to go over to the freezer. I was keeping my vodka in the freezer because if, you, if you're on, on that kind of a drunk, oh, uh, I got to keep the first drink down. If I keep the vodka in the freezer, it will stay down. And I don't go into the dry heaps. So I, uh, for some reason, God, as I understand him, granted me a moment of clarity, a moment where I saw myself exactly as I was. Instead of going over the freezer, I sat down at the kitchen counter and I stared at that freezer. And your faces, the faces of Alcoholics Anonymous came back to me. The exact words of the second step came to me. And it said, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And I, I, I realized that I'd, I'd always read that wrong. It's, uh, I thought it said, we believe in God. Well, what do you believe in? The Catholic God, the Episcopal God, the Church of Christ God, you know. Uh, this is, it came to believe. And I had this clear thought, those people believe in something. Maybe, James, you could come to believe whatever the hell it is they believe in. Maybe you could come to believe it. And at that point, I said a prayer. And I, I don't know where I'd heard these words or whether I'd even heard them, but it was simply something to the effect of God, if there is a God, I don't want to drink that vodka, please help me. And when I said that little prayer, it was like all the fight went out of me. The sound of surrender in my case was just simply, whew, it's all over. It's all over. 
you know, Fred, the accountant in our, in our book of experience in chapter three talks about that being that curious feeling, curious feeling that he wouldn't have to drink. Again. Well, I had that curious feeling right then. I had it. I didn't have any great spiritual, you know, the clouds didn't open up and the booming voice didn't come down and say, this is my beloved James in whom I'm well pleased. You know, that didn't happen. But I submit to you that each and every one of you, as I, as I look at your faces across this Zoom thing, and if I were in person, as I would look at your faces, has in some way or other had that profound spiritual experience, the same as Bill Wilson, where for some reason, before you could not, not drink, and after that point, you did not drink. You did not drink. What could be more profound in a way of a spiritual experience than that? Than that. It was a gift. It was a gift of God's grace. You know, that question that I'd ask in that cathedral on Christmas Eve of 79, what's wrong with me, was finally being answered. I came back to Alcoholics Anonymous with a different attitude. With a different attitude. You know, I'd look for a, a, a sponsor who measured, measured up to my standards. And uh, huh, somehow I found one. Huh? I found one. He was a retired. He used to run guns in New Mexico. And he was currently uh, doing a part-time pest control work. And he was known as the old goat. <laughs> Ed Harding called everybody old goat. This is what Ed Harding looked like. I found a picture of him. And he was also a taper. He was also a taper. And uh, it turned out he was exactly my standard. He was exactly the guy that I needed, uh, that I needed you know, to, to launch me out on this, this, way, this way of life. And uh, I didn't drink for a while. And then one day I had this curious feeling that uh, I hadn't thought about drinking for, uh, I couldn't remember the last time I thought about drinking. Was it last week or was it something? And this is a whole new feeling because before I always thought, can I drink? Can I not drink? Maybe if I just had two drinks, maybe if I could just drink natural California wines and lay off the hard stuff, I'd be all right. You know, those kind of thoughts that, that run through an Alfie, yeah, Alfie's head. And uh, uh, they were gone. They were simply gone. When it's four months over, I went to my first AA convention in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, the Tri-State Convention. And here, and to me before, Alcoholics Anonymous had just been 25 or 30 people sitting around a room. Now, there were a lot of different groups in New Orleans, and I'd go from one group to the next. but uh, uh, AA was still a small thing. Well, well, that night in Shreveport, there was a thousand people in this room. And there was a speaker up there. And I heard a message of Alcoholics Anonymous that I had not heard before. And I, I heard some fabulous speakers that, that weekend. I heard June Guinan We'd gotten sober like what, 13 or 14. And uh, I heard uh, Eddie Lavelle and he told me the most important thing. He, uh, you know, I, I started picking up things from these speakers. He said, and he had picked this up from Chuck Chamberlain that uh, uh, we, uh, say, let me whip my whistle a little bit. He said, we don't think our way into good living. We live our way into good thinking. It is by the actions that we take that our feelings change. You know, this was totally backwards. Uh, I heard Paul Martin on Saturday night talking about swapping a fifth step. You know, when you give your fifth step, uh, your sponsor swaps it back with you and, and uh, so that you don't feel alone. And, and 
on Sunday morning, I heard Dr. Gene Martin talking about that he couldn't do a third step because he, he thought he was so alienated from God, and he's in this jitter joint with a Jesuit priest, of all things. And they finally said, well, it says in the book, maybe uh, we find it desirable to take this step with another understanding person. So they took the third step together. So Monday night with uh, my home group and a bunch of us who had come up there, with Julie especially, uh, who she was an old timer, had four years. <laughs> and uh, uh, we were at the Tiffany Inn Pancake House after the meeting. And I said, you know, maybe Dr. Jean was right. Maybe the only way I'll ever take a third step is to do it with some with somebody else. She says, are you willing to do it right now? I said, Julie, I didn't get sober to pray in pancake houses for crying out loud. She says, don't be a smart ass. The grace may not come to you again. Are you willing to take your third step right here and now? And so with members of the jet set group of Alcoholics Anonymous, we held hands over the remnants of our pancakes and waffles and stuff. And we said that beautiful third step prayer, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self. And what is the bondage of self? It says so on the previous page, fear, self-seeking, self-delusion, self-pity, that self-centered fear that's had me in bondage for my whole life. Relieve me of bondage of self that I may better do thy will. To take away my difficulties. Why? So I can be wonderful? No, so that I can bear witness as I'm trying to do today. Thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. Because that's the big question the third step asks. How will you live? What way of life will you choose? Will you choose God's way or will you choose your way? Your, your way wasn't going too well, was it? How will you live? is the question of the third step. Now, for some reason, I read on in that book for the very first time, because somebody had a book there with them, and it said this decision, though a vital and crucial one, was of little lasting effect unless followed at once by an effort to face and be rid of the things that were blocking us. And I went out to City Park the next day, and I sat under a table, and... Uh, under an oak tree, on a table under an oak tree. And I wrote down the secrets that I swore I'd swear to the, take to the grave. And I put down the facts of my life as best as I could at that time, as best as I could. And it was a late autumn day. It was uh, November the 10th of, uh, of 81. And uh, in New Orleans at that time uh, of the year, uh, very frequently, uh, the clouds rolling in from the Gulf are very low ceiling, you know, maybe only 500 feet over, over the ground. So it's very close and intimate feeling, you know. And uh, it was close to sunset as I'm, as I'm finishing up some of the thing. At that point, at that point, the clouds broke at the horizon at the setting sun. And the setting sun shone through and turned the whole world orange. It reflected off of everything. And I, James, felt that God had just winked at me. Just winked at me and says, you're gonna be all right. As it turned out, I was. I, I can't take you through all the steps. I've only got a few minutes left. Let me just say that, uh, I finally ended up sharing that with some with somebody else, and uh, uh, over a period of years, I didn't make them right real quick. I made my amends. I've had some wonderful adventures in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've had uh, I've I've had the uh, love of women and respect of men. I've uh, I've had two marriages. I wish they would have would have lasted for one reason or another. They did not. But in that second marriage, that first marriage, now she came in visiting in to New Orleans for the Deep South Convention 
and she'd been there a week and she was getting ready to go back to Jamaica where her parents had retired to from New York State. And I said, Dina, long distance relationships don't work. Would you like to get married? <laughs> so anyway, we got married and uh, the final result was I would snatched her out of paradise and uh, she came to, I think, to resent it. But I, I still love, love her dearly. We got along all right. But we had a child together. We had a child together. And, you know, when those first two children were born, I was drunk. I was sitting down in the uh, waiting room, uh, loaded, and uh, wasn't able to be a part of those births. And I wanted to, but I just, I just couldn't. I didn't know how. I didn't know how. I didn't have these tools for living that you all have given me. And when my little Jamie was born, I was in there in the delivery room with the scrubs on. And when the surgeon pulled little Jamie out of Dina, he handed her to me first and that little fingers wrapped around, little hand wrapped around my finger. And I looked into her and I thought, I am looking at the face of God. I'm sharing in his creation right now. And I handed her to my wife. You know, those are the kind of moments that uh, I would have never had except for Alcoholics Anonymous. Let me finish up with one final story. There's only five minutes left, I see. I could rattle on and on. You know, my, my, my dear departed granny used to say, James Robert, you, when I was a little boy, she'd say, James Robert, you just like to talk, hear your head rattle. I took an inventory in AA and it turned out that granny was right. <laughs> so anyway, I've been rattling along for long enough. So let me finish up with, with, with one story. You know, I, uh, I didn't get any DWIs because I was carrying a state police badge. Uh, because when I did some work for the state police, when I was in law school, but, uh, finally towards the end, uh, I forgot to carry it with me and uh, I got in an argument with a cop and, uh, he ended up charging me with DWI and the judge bonded me out. And, uh, the judge was a drinking buddy, so he threw the case out. But, and I, and I cursed the cop. I mean, I just, I cursed the cop. I've raised holy hell with him. You know, I was, I, I was at that stage where the mouth starts rolling before the brain is saying, shut up, shut up, shut up, but the mouth is rolling. I'm sure you all have all been there. Um, and uh, the the DWI got thrown out, but I refused to take the test. So the uh, license suspension hearing was going to take place. And I kept putting it off, putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. Finally, the old goat said, uh, about two years sober, said, James, you've got to go face the, face the music uh, now, you know, and, and, and get, this, get this out of the way. So I was willing to do it. I said, okay, I'm not going to continue at this time. I'll go in and had the hearing and take my suspension for six months for not taking the test. So I go down to the hearing and uh, I'm familiar with traffic court because I had, I'd have cases in traffic court and represent people in DWIs. And even after I got sober, I was going down there doing this, uh, some of this. And there's this big black cop that I had cursed so much during the, uh, uh, during the arrest. And he's sitting, sitting right there, and I'm just kind of looking rather sheepishly at him, you know. And, and uh, the licensed uh, hearing judge says, uh, Officer Boudreau, is this the same man that you arrested uh, the night of so-and-so 1979? And he looked at me, and he looked at the judge, and he says, no. And the judge says, what do you mean? He says, it's right here in the room. He said, is this the same man that you arrested? And the, the officer Boudreau says, no. Oh, uh, no, Your Honor, not the same man. I just sat there, and the judge said, well, I'm going to have to dismiss it. We well, dismissed it, and the officer left. I followed him down the hall. And I said, Officer Boudreau, Officer Boudreau, I'm here. I'd, I'd really like to make amends with you. I don't know why you did that, but... Uh, uh, I'm sober and alcoholics anonymous now for almost two years, and I'm trying to change my way. 
He says, I wasn't lying to that guy. He says, I've been watching you around this courthouse a little bit for the past year or so. And I wasn't lying to that man. You are not the same man that I arrested that night. And that's Alcoholics Anonymous. I love all of y'all. My time is up. Uh, Glenn's going to cut me off. I can see him getting ready. I can see him out there with a the knife. Get this where he goes. Off with his head. <laughs> Thank you all for listening to me and putting up with my little, uh, my little tale of woe. <laughs> I love all of you. Bye.